Thanks to MPB for sponsoring this video. Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my in-depth review of the Fujifilm X106, successor to the enormously popular and almost always out of stock X100V. This video concentrates on photography, with a separate one covering the improved video capabilities. It's the sixth model in a series that packs an APS-C sensor into a fairly compact, vintage-style body with a fixed 23mm lens, that's equivalent to around 35mm. This makes it ideal for street and travel photography, as well as a tempting second body to complement a larger system. Like previous models, it's available in silver or black, with this latest version costing around $1600 or pounds. This makes it a little more expensive than the V in terms of retail pricing, albeit less than many chances have been charging for that model at the peak of its demand. Headline upgrades include Fujifilm's latest 40 megapixel sensor, improved video, and most usefully of all, built-in stabilization or IBIS for short. If you fancy something a bit more exclusive though, there's also a special edition with a soft shutter release, a dedicated strap, box and history card, as well as the serial number on the hot shoe and the original Fujifilm logo from 1934 engraved on the top and on the cap. Appropriately, it's limited to 1934 models and cost £1934 or $2000. In this video, I'll follow up on my initial first looks review, taking a deep dive into the photo quality, the handling and features, directly comparing it against the previous X100V, a camera that I've been using for my own travel photography for over two years. I'll also answer many of the questions that were posted on that first review. Now once again this video concentrates on the photo side of the camera and I'll have a separate review of the movie capabilities which are much improved. This review involved a lot of work so many thanks to MPB for their sponsorship. I think it's fair to say that many of us watching camera reviews on YouTube may already have some older gear that we don't use so much anymore so why not sell it to help pay for an upgrade? MPB is the world's largest online platform for used photo and video gear, so if you have any kit that you're not using anymore, just head over to their website for an instant quote. For example, if you have one of the older X100T or F models in good condition, you could get around £500 to £600 for it. They also operate across Europe and the US. All of their quotes include free collection, so there's no need to factor in delivery costs or queuing at a post office. There's also no need to take any photos for a listing, or no hidden seller's fees or potentially disgruntled buyers to deal with either. Once they receive and confirm the condition of your gear, you can receive the money in your account the next day. Over the years, I've bought and sold used gear on multiple platforms, but I find myself returning to MPB for their simplicity, convenience, and the fact that what they offer is what you actually get. So why not check them out at mpb.com or using the links in the description. Right, back to the review. Now I don't want to repeat too much from my first looks video, so just briefly, the X106 on the right shares a great deal with the V on the left, including essentially the same body design and controls. They're the same width and height, but place them side by side and you'll notice the 6 on the right is a tad thicker, 2mm in total with 0.5mm added to the main body and the remaining 1.5mm to the lens barrel. The 6 is also 43 grams heavier, thanks to the IBIS, but once in my hands I didn't really notice any difference with the V in terms of size and weight, and crucially it remains compatible with all cases and accessories. This includes the filter attachment accessory which is still required to equip the 6 with full weather sealing, as the lens still extends a little bit in use. It's a shame the camera isn't weather sealed as standard, but the flip side is you get to choose the degree of sealing based on the barrel size. The controls and dials feel and operate as before, which means the 6 inherits an unlockable exposure compensation dial. Now on my X100V I found that this could accidentally turn when pulled out of a snug bag or pocket, but I didn't actually notice that during my time with the 6. I think the EV dial and power collar are a bit stiffer when brand new, but may loosen over time. The hybrid viewfinder is also identical to the previous version, so you can compose with an optical view with a number of cunning overlays, including a frame that adjusts for parallax when focusing at different distances. Or you could switch to a fully electronic view, sharing the same 3.69 million dot panel as before, and allowing you to preview things like the depth of field, the colour style and the exposure. Now the greedy side of me was initially disappointed that the panel resolution wasn't increased, but to be honest it's already sufficient for the viewfinder magnification here. 
As before, there's also a third viewing option where you can overlay a small electronic window in the corner of the optical view to check the color and the focus, which could in theory provide the best of both worlds, although I tended to just use the EVF. The screen can still angle up by 90 degrees, but now folds down a little further to 45 degrees, making it easier to frame when holding it high. Like the V, it'll also very neatly fold flush back into the body afterwards. To maintain the body size, Fujifilm's kept the same NP-W126S battery as before, and while the specs suggest it'll now last a bit longer, due in part to a less hungry processor, I found it roughly similar to the V in use. So when composing with the EVF and using IBIS, I typically achieved around 150 photos and a few minutes of video per charge. For video alone, you should get about 75 minutes of 1080 or 4K per charge. The SD slot also remains UHS-1, which means a full buffer can take a few seconds to empty, but then this was never designed as a sports camera. The fastest mechanical burst speed remains 11 frames per second, and when set to uncompressed RAW, I managed to capture 17 frames at this speed before it slowed down to about 1 frames per second. Once I stopped shooting, the camera took about 17 seconds to fully clear the buffer onto the card. Set to large fine JPEG, I managed 37 frames at 11 frames per second, after which it took around 5 seconds to clear. Faster speeds are possible with the electronic shutter up to 13 frames per second at the full resolution, or up to 20 frames per second with a 1.29 times crop, which captures 24 megapixels. Pre-shot capture is also available with the electronic shutter. And finally, the ports are also the same, so you're getting USB-C for charging or data transfer, micro HDMI, and a 2.5mm jack for a remote release or microphone input. I'd personally have preferred they'd switched the mic input to a more common 3.5mm, but then remote release shooters would be the ones needing an adapter. Under the USB settings, you can configure the X106 to become a standard webcam. I tried this out on my MacBook with YouTube Live, where the camera delivered a 1080 60p stream over USB-C, while also accepting power from the computer. Note that I couldn't change the resolution or frame rate though. Now, I wasn't able to try out a long stream, but since I managed over an hour of 1080 recording under battery power alone, with no overheating issues, I'd expect to achieve at least this as a webcam. You could alternatively capture the HDMI output. There's also Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and an option to print directly to selected Instax printers, albeit only the discontinued Wi-Fi models like the SP3, and sadly not any of the current Link models. I have no idea why the Instax and digital divisions of Fujifilm won't play together anymore. There's also support for Frame I.O. for those who want to upload a variety of file formats to the cloud for backup or collaboration. Let me know if you'd like me to make a video about Frame I.O. At the time of making this review, the X106 wasn't fully supported by the phone app, so I'll wait until the next major version is released, then make a new video all about that. Moving on to the lens, the optics are identical to the V, so you're getting a fixed 23mm f2, delivering a roughly 35mm equivalent field of view, with a 10cm closest focusing distance. Get close to your subject, open the aperture, and it's possible to achieve some really nice blurring effects in the background, and I'll show you lots more examples during my verdict. The mild wide coverage is great for general purpose use, but if you want a tighter view, the 6 offers two digital teleconverter options, one delivering 50mm equivalent or roughly standard coverage, and the other getting closer still to 70mm for a short telephoto effect. Both modes, however, are simply cropping the image, and while the X106's high resolution does provide more latitude for cropping than the earlier models, the two teleconverter modes still only leave you with 20 or 10 megapixels respectively. They're also not doing anything to interplay or scale the image, so in my test the final quality was actually no different from just cropping it yourself afterwards. So the only real benefit of using the teleconverter modes is to preview the cropped coverage as you compose with either the EVF or the screen. Note that raw files are not cropped. If you're after broader coverage than 35mm, the X106 offers a panoramic mode from the drive menu. Here's a standard single shot. And now here's a panorama from the same position, showing a much wider field of view. Like earlier models in this series though, the resolution is decreased. In this case, the total image measured just 14 megapixels. And if you look closely, there can be stitching errors. The horizon here is jagged at times, and there's some repetition of moving objects. Sometimes it can work well, but for fewer artifacts and high resolution results, I'd suggest just taking multiple frames and stitching them manually in post. 
for optically wider or tighter views, the X106 is compatible with the WCL and TCL adapters, which screw onto the barrel and convert the equivalent coverage to 28 or 50mm respectively. Both maintain the full resolution but add to the size and weight of the camera. So if you regularly want to change the coverage optically, I'd recommend getting one of the interchangeable lens cameras instead, like an X-T30 or whatever its successor becomes. Like earlier models in the series, the X106 employs a leaf shutter built right into the lens, which is not only very quiet, but also allows you to synchronize flashes up to the top mechanical speed of 4,000th of a second. Now, I believe that the shutter mechanism is identical to the V, but I was surprised to find it much quieter in use. For example, here's the sound of the X100V. And now here's the sound of the newer X106 recorded with exactly the same microphone settings. Pretty quiet, right? And this confused me until I checked the settings on both models. Now both cameras can play an artificial shutter sound if you'd like something different or louder for both the mechanical and the electronic shutter, but by default the X106 has its mechanical volume set to zero versus two on the X100V. And this is why the V sounds louder as it's actually playing an artificial click sound on top of the actual shutter itself. Reduce the X100V shutter volume to zero and it'll be as quiet as the six. Or for a louder click on the new model, just increase its volume. Mystery solved. Oh, and the X106 also keeps the built-in four-stop ND filter, which is activated in the menus for photo or video. Here I've fixed the sensitivity to 125 ISO and the aperture to f4, and without the ND, the camera's metering a shutter speed of around 105th of a second. After activating the ND filter in the menu though, the camera now meters an eighth of a second, confirming the four stops. Not only does this let you shoot wide open under any conditions, especially when you also have a top electronic shutter speed of 180 thousandth of a second at your disposal, but it also lets you deploy some longer exposures in daytime conditions. Here's a shot I took with the previous X100V, where at f16 and 160 ISO, I was able to achieve a one second exposure, thanks to the ND filter, which is now just about hand-holdable on the 6, thanks to IBIS. Now without the ND filter, I was stuck at 15th per second with little to no blurring in the water. And it's even more useful for video as I'll show you in my separate review of the movie capabilities. Moving on, by adopting the latest sensor and image processor, the X106 inherits all of the subject recognition of other recent X cameras. So while the X100V only offered human face and eye detection, the 6 gains an additional menu with options for animals, birds, cars, bikes, planes and trains. Now obviously with a mild wide angle lens, some of these subjects are going to be too far away and too small in the frame to be recognized. So when it comes to birds, you'll really only exploit it for large and tame specimens like Steven Seagull here, rather than those in flight. For animals, also think less in the wild and more of the staged pet portraits at close range. As for cars, it certainly works, although I'm not sure how much I'd use it. Human detection though is a different matter, and like its predecessor, the X106 does a pretty good job at recognizing and tracking a person, locking onto their closest eye if you set it to auto. You'll also enjoy a little blurring in the background at F2, especially when the subject is at head and shoulder distance. I would have preferred it though if human and the other subject types were all in the same menu. I wondered whether having the latest sensor and image processor would speed up the autofocus over the previous versions, so I recorded the 6 pulling focus between the foreground bottle and the background shutters here. There's occasional wobbles to confirm focus, but it gets the job done pretty quickly. For comparison, here's the older X100V using exactly the same settings, and to me anyway, it looks pretty much identical in terms of speed. Now I've seen some X bodies with high end lenses focusing faster, so Clearly the 23 f2 lens of the X100V and 6 is a limiting factor. That said, it never held me back in day-to-day -day use and I think it's fine for this kind of camera. Just don't expect the 6 to be notably faster than the V in terms of focusing. Okay, now for my image quality test with one of the headline upgrades being the switch from 26 to 40 megapixels by employing the same sensor as the X-T5 and X-H2. You can record images in the choice of three resolutions with five aspect ratios for each the option to record compressed files, raw files or both, the choice of storing those raw files as uncompressed, losslessly compressed 
or with lossy compression, and thanks to the new image processor, the choice of either JPEG or HIF. There's also the current collection of film simulations, including the latest Riala Ace. The 6 is the first X camera to inherit this sim from the GFX 102, but it'll now also be added to the older XH2, XH2S, XT5 and XS20 with a firmware update. Now the film sims are responsible for great looking outer camera JPEGs, but it's important to look beyond the influencer hype and realize they aren't exclusive to the X100 cameras. First, a selection of film sims are available on all Fujifilm cameras, new and old, not just this one. And secondly, most other brands also have some pretty good looking profiles. I may personally like Fujifilm's colour profiles, but they're not a magic bullet to success, nor a mystical recreation of actual film. The big question for me though is whether the X106 is recording meaningfully greater detail than the V. 40 megapixels sounds a lot more than 26, but actually only equates to about a 25% boost in linear resolution, plus there's the factor of the lens as well. So here's a view of Brighton Pier that I shot with both cameras side by side, starting with the X106. I'll zoom into the image and put the 6 with its 40 megapixels on the left, and the X100V with its 26 megapixels on the right. Now if you're pixel peeping, you will notice the 6 on the left is indeed a little crisper, with ever so slightly finer details resolved than the V on the right, but is far from night and day. I showed some similar comparisons in my first looks review, which you might be interested, where you might assume it's the lens that's holding the X106 back. But again, remember 26 to 40 megapixels only represents a 25% increase in linear resolution. It's not as much as you might think. To further illustrate this, here's a close-up comparison from my X-H2 review with the 40 megapixel camera on the left versus the 26 megapixel X-H2S on the right, both fitted with a very sharp lens. And even with these top-end optics, the difference is pretty mild. So I'd say the lens on the X106 is certainly capable of exploiting the resolution of the sensor behind it, but crucially, the difference between 40 and 26 megapixels in real life isn't as much as you'd think. That said, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, the presence of IBIS can make a significant difference to the quality in use. But first, a noise comparison. The sensor in the X106 has a slightly lower base sensitivity of 125 ISO versus 160 on the previous generation, so I'll start with that before zooming in for a closer look. As before, the 40 megapixel 6 is on the left and the 26 megapixel V is on the right. These are all JPEGs out of camera, although I do have raw comparisons in my X-H2 photo review, which will apply here too. Starting with both cameras at their respective base sensitivities, you can again see a mild boost in detail from the 6 on the left, but nothing too significant. As I increase the sensitivity one stop at a time, you'll see the image on the left gradually soften its ultimate detail, while I'd say the V on the right is doing a slightly better job at retaining details. In particular, as I approach the higher sensitivities from 3200 ISO onwards, I'd say the V on the right begins to match or even exceed the detail of the 6 on the left. Again though, this is serious pixel peeping and I wouldn't notice that much difference at more common reproduction sizes. But in a key benefit over its predecessors, the X106 becomes the first model in the series to sport built-in stabilization, or IBIS for short, which in my test really did deliver five to six stops of compensation under a wide variety of conditions. I personally found I could easily handhold exposures of half a second on the X106, and if I was really careful, even one or two seconds. You're actually looking at a two second exposure that I shot handheld with the 6, where IBIS has kept the image nice and sharp. Now what this means in practice is that you can keep handholding the 6 at its lowest sensitivities under much dimmer conditions than the models before it. Let's say you needed a 30th of a second to handhold the X100V without any camera shake, which under dim conditions meant boosting the sensitivity to say 3200 ISO. Well, under the same conditions, IBIS could let you handhold the X106 at, say, one second, allowing you to use the base sensitivity of 125 ISO. So now here's the 6 on the left at 125 ISO and the V on the right at 3200 ISO, where there's now a significant difference in quality. Of course, terms and conditions apply. A one second exposure means that anything on the frame that's in motion is going to become blurred, so it's not going to help you if you need a fast shutter speed in order to free some action. But if the subject is static, or you can embrace motion blur for creative effects, IBIS will allow the 6 to maximize its potential quality under a much broader variety of conditions. 
Here's some handheld shots that I took around dusk under very dim conditions at between eighth and half a second, all of which allowed the camera to stay at 125 ISO for very crisp and clean results. In fact, I became so confident with the IBIS that I reprogrammed the slowest shutter speed in auto ISO to be an eighth of a second, and even that was being conservative. Again though, if you need to freeze action or even minor movement when say photographing people, there is no substitute for a faster shutter speed, which in turn will force you to use higher ISOs depending on the lighting. But if your style of photography can exploit IBIS, it is a game changer on the X106. And while I was initially skeptical over its value in steadying a 35mm view during composition, it actually made a visible difference, at least when using the EVF4 screen. Here's the view when composing without IBIS, where it's wobbling a little. Not hugely, but it will impact how accurately you can handhold a very precise composition. Now go into the menus to enable IBIS and return to a much steadier view, at least again when composing electronically. I personally find this really useful when lining up very precise compositions, and I actually missed it when returning to the unstabilized X100V. IBIS also finally makes the X100 useful for handheld video, and I'll talk much more about that in my review of the movie mode. Oh, and note if you are holding the camera when it's powered down, you may feel that IBIS mechanism wobbling or rattling a little bit inside the body. This is however normal for any camera with IBIS, and it stops as soon as you power them up. Oh, and by squeezing IBIS into the smallest X-series camera, I think it's a pretty safe bet we'll also now see it on all models in the future. <coughs> XT30 replacement anyone? Moving on to dynamic range with the new sensor, here's a shot that I took at Brighton Pier where exposing for the upper side means that the lower section of the pier is in pretty dark shadow. You can see from the histogram that the shadows are clipped, but adjusting the shadow slider in Adobe Camera Raw here allows you to retrieve a decent amount of detail in this area if desired. At the other end of the scale, here's a view of a brightly backlit window where the details on the outside roofing and the distant trees are saturated. Reducing the highlight slider in camera raw though can retrieve some of that previously lost detail, so clearly there's latitude at both ends of the scale if you're into post-processing raw files. Before wrapping up, a quick note on multiple exposures accessed from the drive menu where you can initially select the ways in which the frames will be combined. Here's some examples using two frames on each, but with different composite settings. When shooting multiple exposures, the X106 lets you capture up to nine images, previewing the combination so far in a ghostly version so that you can better align the next shot. And if you don't like the one that you've just taken, you can delete it and try again, or just exit the capture process when you've finished. Raw files of each separate frame are also recorded. Okay, now for my final verdict, during which I'll show you a selection of images taken with the final production X106. If you'd like a closer look at any of them, I've provided a bunch in their original format on my review page for the camera at cameralabs.com. The Fujifilm X106 builds upon the hugely popular X100V, enhancing both its photo and video quality without compromising the core appeal. It shares the same compact vintage styling, the same controls, lens, viewfinder, screen, battery and ports, but upgrades the sensor and processor and remarkably squeezes IBIS into a body that's only barely thicker and heavier than before. In my test, the high resolution didn't make a huge difference to the real life detail over the X100V, but the presence of IBIS transforms the potential quality under dimmer conditions, allowing you to handhold much slower shutter speeds and keep that ISO low for the best results. I managed to handhold sharp results as slow as two seconds and found that one quarter was very achievable. Of course, this won't help if you need to freeze motion in low light, but if your subject is mostly static or you can embrace motion blur, it is a very useful improvement. IBIS also makes video considerably more usable on the X106 over its predecessors, and while the focal length and lack of flip screen mean you still won't be handheld vlogging from in front of the camera, you will be enjoying far superior results from behind it. Plus, much longer recording times make it a more practical camera overall. And while the retail price is a couple of hundred more than the X100V when it was first launched, that model has rarely been sold for that in recent years. So arguably you're now getting IBIS and greater availability for free. Speaking of that availability, Fujifilm has built a new factory in China for the X106. And while this means it's the first in the series not to be made in Japan, it should mean that you stand a much greater chance of actually getting hold of one. Amazingly though, given the success of the V, the series continues to find itself with little to no competition if you want a high-end, fixed-lens compact. 
Sure, there's the Leica Qs, but they're three times the price. And while Ricoh's aging GR3 is smaller and cheaper, it doesn't have the viewfinder or the vintage styling. Ultimately, I'd say most owners of the X100V could probably skip the upgrade, unless of course they'd regularly exploit IBIS. But if you have an older X100, or you're still on a waiting list for a V, or simply want a high quality, all in one, the X106 is an easy camera to recommend. If I didn't have a V of my own, I'd be ordering one right now. And if you're remotely tempted, I'd get your order in sooner rather than later, as initial demand is already looking pretty high. I've got links in the description to the current pricing. And that's it for this review of the photo capabilities of the X106. Let me know what you think in the comments, and be sure to check out my review of the movie mode, as it is substantially better than any model in this series to date. And thanks again to MPB for sponsoring this video. If you have any photo gear to buy, sell or trade, check them out at the links in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.